Thank you, Maria. Welcome everybody and good afternoon. Um, thank you for attending this webinar about understanding resiliency in indigenous survivors. So a quick overview of what we're going to be discussing today. Um, I'd like to preface with a quick discussion about indigenous Native American, Native American Indian, Alaska Native um, references to folks all of these are interchangeable and are definitely up to an individual's preference. Um, so when you're working with an indigenous Native American survivor or their families, ask what their preference is. Um, but you'll hear me interchange throughout this webinar um, uh, between uh, those identities. So we're going to have a brief introduction to Colorado Native American history. Um, we also are going to share a survivor story. We're having technical issues with this video. Um, we will uh, share that uh, YouTube link to you so you can uh, check that video out. It's about seven minutes long um, on your own time. Uh, we're not able to uh, show that um, today, but we will be referencing this story. So I'll do my best to try to catch you up um, since we're not able to uh, view it together. Gina. Gina, just really quickly, so we're going to link. so yeah. keep an eye out for that in the chat box whenever we're going to do that. So we're going to have it's going to be a little bit awkward. So we're going to send you the link. You're going to watch it and we're going to let about seven minutes or so elapse so you can watch it and then we'll come back um, together. So just to give you an idea of how that's going to look. Perfect. Thank you. So we'll be referencing that story um, throughout when we talk about some aspects of um, ex the experience of sexual assault survivors um, in Indigenous uh, folks. We're going to analyze a jurisdiction experience for survivors and how that creates barriers to services um, and can also create delayed or unreported assaults. How to uh, um, apply your advocacy with this understanding. And we'll wrap up with a discussion about tribal collaboratives or coalition work, where you fit in in that network. And we'll end with what resilience looks like, um, can look like for indigenous survivors and their families. So we're gonna do a quick poll right now and I'm gonna let Maria take the handles on that. Um, but just a quick test of, if you might know if there are tribal nations in the state of Colorado, and a bonus is if uh, you you know how many there are. Cool. So um, you all are voting. Um, if you if you check yes um, and you want to answer the bonus question about how many, go ahead and type in the um, chat questions chat box how many you think they there are if you're voting yes. Okay. Um, so again, still so far, we have 100% of folks who say yes. We have about three quarters of you who have voted. So I'm going to leave it open for a little bit, um, just a little bit longer to give folks the opportunity to, to vote. Um, and we have those numbers coming in. Folks are guessing two. Um, some go folks are guessing five. Um, so it's between two and five so far um, that folks are, um, are guessing Gina. I'm going to go ahead and close the, cool. the poll. It's um, it's not changing much, right? 100% um, of you all say um, yes, and then it's between two and five, and then we do have one four. Nice. The interesting answer is those may all very those may very well be true. <laughs> So um, currently there are two federally and state recognized tribes here in Colorado, the Southern Ute Indian tribe located in Ignacio, Colorado, and the Ute Mountain Ute tribe located in Toya, Colorado, along with a portion of their reservation that lies in a community called White Mesa in Utah. Um, but I also would like to uh, introduce you to uh, the third Ute tribe that resides in uh, Utah. It's called the Ute Indian tribe or referred to as the Northern Ute tribe in Fort Duchesne. And this fourth uh, seal you'll see here is representative of the Colorado River Indian tribes or CRIT. 
Um, I myself am a member of the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe. I work remotely for CICASA in my position and from my home here in Toyoc, Colorado. So this is why I say that um, variation between two and five may be correct. Um, folks might be um, thinking about the original inhabitants of what we uh, know now as Colorado, uh, that this the state um, was the original homelands of um, other tribal nations, including the Apache, the Arapaho, Cheyenne nations, Pueblo tribes, Shoshone, as well as the Ute nations. And Gina, somebody- An important step. Somebody typed Go ahead, into the question chat box that the Navajo Nation has also recently purchased land in Colorado. Oh, correct. They are also indicated on the, on the map. I didn't mention that. Yes, that's correct. Super cool stuff, taking some land back. So an important step in advocacy and resiliency um, for you all who may not be tribal um, services or tribal departments um, or advocates um, is to understand that acknowledging that we all reside, work, and play in land stolen from these original tribal nations is an important step in advocacy and resiliency to uh, Indigenous or Native American survivors. So here's the um, survivor story we'd like to share with you all. Um, again, uh, check out that link. Um, and we're going to give you about seven minutes um, to watch that video on your own so that way you can see it in its entirety and uh, you won't you'll be able to see it without the kind of technical lagging that we're having on our end. I would also like to um, issue a trigger warning uh, that there there is um, the subject of rape and suicide and substance abuse so any of your practices of self-care and and any practices you use to take care of yourself um, in we don't want to further harm you. Um, you provide very important services, and we all we need you to um, we need you to be uh, taken care of so that you can continue to do your work for survivors as well.
Perfect. So it looks like folks are starting okay. to come back. Um, yes, go ahead, Gina. Great. Okay, folks, thank you for checking out that uh, video. Um, though Becky's story is it's complicated and it's highly concerning, um, it's also not out of the norm for how Native American survivors um, experience their assault and the intricacies that can follow. Um, so let's take a minute and recover before we dive into to do uh, some of those nuances and, and talk about how you may fit into the advocacy that a Native American survivor like Becky um, would benefit from in working with you. Um, you're seeing a picture of the Sleeping Ute Mountain um, as it's seen from Cortez, uh, which is 11 miles from the reservation here in Toyoc. Um, and that is where I am, uh, I'm broadcasting um, from right now very beautiful area out here. So just a really quick and brief overview of some of the jurisdictional um, maze involved in uh, sexual assault and, and crimes. Um, in Indian country. This is in no way comprehensive. There's a lot more to this, but this is this is what we're um, going to use in understanding uh, sexual assault uh, in this webinar. So we'll start with the Major Crimes Act, um, which allowed federal government um, jurisdiction over crimes like rape. Public Law 280, which gave federal jurisdiction to states um, but also note that neither the states or, or tribal governments consented to this arrangement um, and were not equipped with uh, resources uh, to enforce crimes. Then there was the Oliphant Suquamish uh, decision in 1978 that eliminated uh, tribal, tribal uh, criminal jurisdiction over anyone who was not a member of a federally recognized tribe, so non-Indians. And then in VAWA 2013 came the Special Domestic Violence Criminal Jurisdiction, which recognized and affirmed, and affirmed the inherent sovereign authority of tribal governments to exercise criminal jurisdiction over some non-Indians who violate protection orders or commit domestic violence or dating violence against Indian victims in tribal lands. Um, it, this uh, VAWA created a framework for tribal courts to prosecute non-Indians again, which hadn't happened since the Oliphant decision. Um, and uh, as early as 2018, I think this number is a little bit different now that we're in 2020, but in 2018, 18 tribes were known to be exercising this special uh, domestic violence criminal jurisdiction over non-Indians in cases involving uh, Indian uh, victims. So a quick note about the tribal reporting structure, which kind of uh, filtered through decisions like this jurisdictional maze here, uh, which created uh, this reality that each tribal nation has its own government structure, its own culture and unique response to survivors and its community. Uh, tribal governments also have their own unique relationships with the U.S. government that impact where and to whom survivors report their assault and how and by whom a sexual assault is investigated and prosecuted. Um, a cool silver lining is uh, the aspect of tribal advocates. Some tribes employ their own advocates or have access to federal victim advocates, all of which are important assets to survivors. Uh, when coming into my previous position as a tribal advocate, it became very clear that a skill in legal an, an, uh, analysis and understanding this jurisdictional maze uh, would be pivotal to my role along with locating resources uh, for survivors. I want to add that as we walk through um, this very brief understanding of these systems um, that you see why this is referred to as a maze, but also keep in mind that it's a very, very different experience uh, living in this knowing that your life, your sacredness are enveloped in this incredibly complex framework that's still learning from itself. It's still changing. 
um, and hopefully still presenting forward movement for Native American Indigenous communities, as well as their survivorship. So let's talk very briefly about our Colorado Ute Tribes law enforcement agencies um, and some differences there. Uh, so due to uh, resource capabilities, um, you know, there's, there's a difference in how both of these tribes um, respond to and are able to um, uh, house their own uh, law enforcement um, services in their uh, tribes. The Southern Ute Indian tribe have their own police department, their own court, and up until recently, their own jail. Uh, so their police are tribal police. Uh, their court is tribal court for crimes on uh, Southern Ute Indian lands. Uh, Southern Ute Police Department will respond to those. The Ute Mountain Ute tribe uh, previously had their own tribal police department, uh, but now have their law enforcement court and corrections within the Bureau of Indian Affairs um, Office of Justice Services, uh, which uh, makes their services and departments federal. So federal officers, federally re regulated courts, um, federal uh, victim specialists, and so on. Their offices, jail, and dispatch uh, reside in the Chief Ignacio Justice Center located in Toyoc. For all crimes committed on Ute Mountain land, uh, BIA out of Toyoc would be the responding law enforcement uh, for the Ute Mountain Indian tribe. So something you'll hear a lot about in uh, tribal communities or in talking about Indian country or Native American indigenous survivors is this idea of tribal sovereignty, um, which is a tribe's right and their power held to govern itself and its members without interference from any other government, um, including without interference from any other tribe, from any state, from any local or federal government. Um, however, today I would like us to focus on the impact of sovereignty in terms of its people, specifically when they become victims or survivors of crime. And so we're going to talk about what this means. Quickly, though, I'd like for us to take part in this poll. What do you think jurisdiction can be? Is it over land? Is it over crime? Is it over a person? Or is it over all of those things? Great, so we have the votes coming in. We have about uh, a third of you all who have voted. In the meantime, Gina, um, there was a question that came in um, that asked whether Colorado okay. um, was a, a PL 280 state. Um, so the question exactly was Colorado is not a PL 280 state, right? Correct. Cool. Um, okay, so 60% of folks have voted so far. 93% um, have said all. And then we have 3% who have said person, 3% who have said crime. Um, so it looks like we're kind of at the point where most folks um, who are going to vote have voted. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and close out that poll. Um, and share the results with folks. Um, so it didn't change very much. We did have 3% um, say land, 3% said crime, 3% said person, and 90% of folks said all. Right, so the answer to that is all. So sovereignty, it greatly impacts um, the idea of jurisdiction, how jurisdiction will be defined, how it will be applied. So a location of the assault, as well as the body of the victim or survivor and the body of the defendant or perpetrator is also considered jurisdiction and, and will also have to be analyzed as such. So if there's anything you can take away from this um, maze and this complex system of jurisdiction is this um, handy chart um, which can give you kind of a quick um, analysis of 
um, of a crime committed in Indian country, depending upon who the victim and defendant is. So for federal, uh, so for felonies, they'll be given to um, federal jurisdiction when the victim is Indian and the defendant is Indian and the tribe can run some concurrent um, jurisdiction over misdemeanors resulting from that assault. Um, when your victim is non-Indian and your defendant is Indian, um, same when your victim and your defendant are both non-Indian and this assault happened in Indian country, the state would take jurisdiction over that case. Um, if the victim is Indian, defendant is non-Indian, it's federal, uh, uh, federal jurisdiction um, over the felonies and the misdemeanors. And again, you know, that, that goes back to the VAWA 2013 decision, um, which is the exception to that for, for tribes who are able to um, take that on and prosecute non-Indians for, um, for some crimes like domestic violence in their courts. And then for victimless crimes, depending on um, who the defendant is, if the defendant is Indian, it's a federal and tribal jurisdiction for non-Indians in victimless crimes, uh, state will have, states will have jurisdiction and generally federal and tribal um, systems will not have jurisdiction over victimless crimes involving a non-Indian defendant. So I just wanted to run through a really quick activity uh, scenario. Um, this is a made up scenario just to kind of help you understand how that chart could apply. Um, so this is a story about Sarah and Clark. Uh, Sarah is a Ute woman who has only met Clark the night of an assault. Clark is a friend of friends and is Lakota on a camping trip in the Four Corners. Um, with their friends, they, they meet. Uh, while visiting a nearby town in Colorado, Sarah reports a sexual assault that happened and during that camping trip. Um, and so what is most likely the assessment um, of how this assault will be responded to and who will take that report? So, you know, when we look at that chart, um, we have to assess uh, jurisdiction and remember that it matters what state or tribe is located in. So that PL280 um, criteria, what crime we're talking about, um, a sexual assault is considered major crime, so that would fall under the Major Crimes Act. Um, who is the victim? Who is the defendant? And in this scenario, they're both Indian. And where did that, where did the assault take place? So that's, that can also, this is a very simplistic view of um, this scenario, but even in that part of the story, uh, the camping trip in the Four Corners, the Four Corners is literally the meeting of four different, four separate states. It also is the meeting uh, meeting of uh, uh, different tribal nations, uh, reservation borders, um, state borders. So that could become a very complicated um, jurisdiction uh, assessment. Uh, it's very likely and has happened in in cases where law enforcement will have to break out a measuring tape and see geographically um, and could make a difference in terms of yards or feet uh, who will have jurisdiction over that case. So you see, so you kind of understand how complicated uh, jurisdiction gets and how, how pivotal a role sovereignty uh, plays in determining jurisdiction and the process that this case will uh, um, go through. So, you know, as advocates, as service providers, consider, you know, how would a, how would a survivor feel facing all of this, um, facing the jurisdictional maze? What do you think um, an Indigenous survivor's takeaway from having to confront this maze and their assault? Um, how would, how will you prep this survivor? And I'll tell you from my personal experience, it's very difficult um, but part of advocacy is being straightforward. Um, even in the best of circumstances, there's no promise whether you are um, Native American or Indigenous survivor or a non-Indian um, of a positive outcome for you. Uh, but for a Native American Indigenous survivor, um, those systems um, are very difficult and um, just keeping those things in mind. So that scenario can play out in many different ways. We could, we could um, work this activity out um, 
probably all day long about uh, you know how how this would go forward or how it wouldn't. Um, are there any questions at this time? I wanted to give a quick opportunity for folks to or check in to see if anybody had any questions so far. So Gina, so far we haven't had other than that PL280 question, we haven't had others come in, but okay. folks, please do take this opportunity to type any questions that you may have that are coming up. Um, and if anything comes through, Gina, I'll be sure to let you know. Perfect, thank you. So for those of you who are able to take a look at um, Becky's story in the video. Um, I'd like to go back to that and pull some things from her experience and what she spoke about. So the lack of prosecution in her case. Um, so what could have, you know, what could have resulted in that happening? Um, it does take a long time for cases to make their way through that, through those systems. Um, but some questions to think about, you know, was Becky and her parent, Becky was not an adult at the time of her assault. Um, was she and her parents cooperative with law enforcement? How cooperative were they? Um, was alcohol involved? Were perpetrators um, related to law enforcement or related to tribal government officials? And we'll talk a little bit later about how those things can affect um, or create barriers um, to services. Uh, was it a jurisdictional issue or decision um, in trying to determine whose case it was? Was there enough evidence? And then there was the media aspect. You know, years had passed since Becky's assault um, and she had found out some uh, developments about her perpetrators from the news and the Crime Stoppers, um, uh, the Crime Stoppers uh, show and how things like that re-victimize um, survivors. And how might a an advocate been very uh, could have been very helpful or beneficial to Becky in understanding or at least um, thinking about how how that might affect her uh, and her trauma. Becky talked about uh, traditional court, um, which is a restorative justice model, and in the Navajo Nation, it's called the Peacekeeper Court. Um, which when applied to uh, maybe some misdemeanors or some property crimes um, can work to, can work effectively in, in tribal communities, but when applied in sexual assault cases um, can be harmful in that decisions and mediation uh, can take place with family members of, of a survivor. Without the survivor, um, decisions are final. Um, remedies sometimes involve payments or exchange of livestock or goods for the wrongdoing and this oftentimes rings of goods in exchange for sexual violence. Um, you saw in um, Becky's experience she moved away from her homelands um, and this is due to the close um, relationships in the small tribal communities that exist uh, where there may be limited locations for groceries, um, getting gas, places of worship, social events, um, which make the chances of running into your perpetrator or their families extremely likely and um, unavoidable. Um, PTSD or healing, you know, can be most difficult in this setting and often lends itself to unhealthy coping methods like substance abuse and, and suicide attempts or ideations. Um, when I was working as a tribal advocate, I also responded to uh, suicide calls with law enforcement or with emergency responders. Um, so understanding this intersection um, became very uh, real uh, for me and um, helped us shape what our services, um, our victim services in our tribal community um, needed to look like and how we needed to um, confront that intersection um, because it's, it's very devastating. And then the healing and counseling that Becky found um, only when she left her homelands um, because of uh, because of that aspect of being a close community. Um, and only when she did that was, was Becky able to find the space in the setting to confront her trauma and her addictions. Um, counseling in, in Western therapy was how she began to work through it. And then finally, Becky returned home with her resilience work implemented you know, Becky came home knowing full well 
that the issues she faced before weren't weren't different and they weren't changed. Um, rather, she had she had changed. She had built her resilience by supplementing different ways to access those needs that she had in order to um, to overcome uh, her trauma. So these were Becky's, and let's talk some more about other bar other barriers that uh, Native American Indigenous survivors may face uh, that an advocate would gain some insight by understanding. Like other survivors, you know, fear of reprisal, the shame and self-blame, confusion about re reporting options um, are all barriers to services. Historical trauma for Native American Indigenous survivors is, is a very important barrier as well. And um, all service providers would do well to understand historical trauma, um, which is a, a defined as a, cumul a cumulative emotional and psychological wounding across generations, including the lifespan, which emanates from massive group trauma. Um, and because of trauma like that, um, that lies um, in a tribal community's history and in generations, you know, it's immense. It, it creates this, it creates community norms um, where individuals um, continue to be affected by this history and it resonates in how uh, survivors respond to sexual violence, um, normalized violence in tribal communities is is um, is very real and um, is a barrier that advocates um, once once advocates can understand that um, you can you can be very helpful in 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 helping overcome this and, and helping support a survivor through um, understanding that um, that as part of their current trauma that there you know there was a trauma in the in their history and in their in, in their um, within their uh, people so you know survivors of violence sexual violence who um, seek medical care or emotional support or wanted to report to law enforcement determine jurisdiction um, in or try to get some offender accountability, they faced some very poorly defined options. Um, his, these historical realities continue today and make it difficult for indigenous and Native American individuals to access services and for their communities to hold those offenders accountable. So it's very rare that you'll find um, specific um, services for sexual assault survivors like SANE, um, SANE care within tribal communities, it's most likely that they'll have to travel um, great distances, um, which is the location and access barrier. Um, a lot of folks lack the resources to be able to do that on their own. So advocacy really needs to take that into consideration. And we have traveled great distances um, to get folks to the proper medical care that they need. The fear of retaliation and confidentiality piece is very real within tribal communities um, because of how close um, we are to one another. Uh, in my experience, when I ran victim services, we had an unmarked building, um, an office that was um, designated to us to provide our services. We offered after hours uh, meeting times um, for folks who did have transportation and were able to meet elsewhere. I also made myself available to do that in order to, you know, help try to uh, protect the privacy of survivors and help them through their case and help them understand um, their reporting options. And the relationships aspect is also very important to think about, um, even for tribal advocates. So um, a suggestion I have and how you can help support that is to reach out to um, your your nearby uh, tribal community, um, if they have tribal advocates there, and and see if you can offer that advocate some support. I do know that um, accessing, um, you know, neighboring or partner uh, 
advocacy agencies um, allowed me a place to debrief in 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 a area or in a agency that wasn't related to uh, my community. So that was also very helpful um, to keep me able to uh, do my work as well. Great, Gina. So there are a couple of questions yeah. that have come in. Um, someone asked regarding the information sure. you shared so far, particularly with the like jurisdictional aspects of it, and then the debriefing with Becky, um, how does that play out for minors? So for kiddos, it gets even more complex, right? So depending on if these kiddos are um, enrolled members of a tribe, this can prompt um, uh, ICWA, which is the Indian Child Welfare Act, um, which determines where a child will be placed if that needs to happen um, as a result of, of their sexual abuse. Um, this, it automatically um, prompts a federal level prosecution, investigation, and response. So FBI will immediately be involved when it involves kiddos. Um, it just gets a lot more complex that way uh, when it comes to kids. Um, and if those kiddos are, are not enrolled, but are kiddos of enrolled members of tribes, um, then there's also kind of a tug of war uh, between uh, ICWA and, and state agencies about what is the proper um, direction uh, for how that case will be handled and where that child will be placed. So it gets, it gets a lot more uh, complicated uh, for, for kiddos that way. Great. That's a good question. Um, good. The other question yeah. was... It's a very difficult aspect for me as well. Yeah, for sure. Um, the other question, Gina, was um, in terms of the traditional courts. Um, so when they go through the traditional courts, are the perpetrators not reported up to the National Sex Offender Registry? So for Navajo Nation, and that's, and I'll refer to that because the Peacekeeper Court and in Becky's story, that's who we're talking about. They do have SORNA within their tribe but how that happens and if that happens, how quickly that happens, how effectively that happens are all questions and are all things that um, are uh, discussed among tribal, um, tribal advocates and tribal agencies. Um, and hopefully um, uh, through collaborative work, uh, tribal leadership and legislators um, are taking that into consideration so that they can better that system. Great, and then can you define SORPA for folks? Or SORNA, SORNA, sorry. <laughs> SORNA is the Sex Offender uh, Registry. Uh, tribes have the option of taking that on um, themselves in uh, managing uh, the Sex Offender Registry there in their um, reservation, or if they'll leave that up to the state or the county to do that. Great. And that all depends on uh, resources and capability. Thanks, Gina. Yeah. So you'll see a lot of similarities here in, in why there's delayed or unreported um, sexual assault cases in uh, Indigenous survivors. So the embarrassment and shame could come from the family member being a perpetrator. Maybe they rely on the defendant or perpetrator for medical related assistance. Um, maybe it was an alcohol or drug facilitated assault, or maybe um, the victim is uh, identifies as LGBTQ two-spirit and the stigmas around those identities within their own family um, creates that delayed or unreported um, assault. The mistrust of uh, or lack of confidence of systems um, can be found in the betrayal of Native American Indigenous in the medical, criminal justice, and um, just the overall historical uh, mistreatment of Native American uh, Indigenous folks. Um, specifically, uh, I'd like to draw your attention to the Indian Health Services or IHS history of forced sterilization on Native American women. 
and the recent prosecution of a longtime children's physician for crimes against Native American boys that spanned over decades and um, over many states and reservations, um, just in that one uh, doctor. Um, I'll have that article attached. You can check that out later um, as well. So understand fully the environment of mistrust that is still alive even today. Um, a quick kind of reminder is unless you are, are an identified um, member of a tribe with a CIB or a certificate of Indian blood, um, certifying that you're an enrolled member of a tribe or descendant of an enrolled member of a tribe or an employee of IHS, you may not or that survivor may not qualify for those services. So um, don't assume. And when we're um, locating um, important documents for a survivor, um, particularly for a Native American Indigenous survivor, that CIB might need to be um, on your checklist as well. Um, the fear of retaliation of, from the perpetrator and their families, this is especially important in understanding protective orders, uh, uh, especially if they're ineffective. And that might be because a fam, uh, the perpetrator is a family member that lives in the same house or nearby. Um, it might be because tribal court protection orders are not recognized by off-reservation jurisdictions. That's definitely an experience I had where a tribal uh, protection order needed to be domesticated. So though there should be full faith and credit um, involved with those protection orders, sometimes as an advocate, you have to do that extra step to make sure that that happens. And again, the historical generational trauma and the lack of those um, important services like saying and knowledge of those services. So in your outreach, um, be sure to um, be sure to hit up tribal communities or um, or to uh, remind um, Native American Indigenous folks that your services are also there for them as well. Are there any questions at this time, Maria? Yes, one question came in specifically about um, that seeking services outside of their community. So um, a person asked, do you see tribe victims who prefer to seek help out of their communities? Yeah, definitely. So um, that's also a part of kind of the discussion from even Becky's story. So she, so we saw that she uh, left her home in order to do that. So sometimes a survivor can supplement um, if they're not ready at the time or if they don't feel confident in tribal services that they can reach out to um, to a resource or to services or an advocate that is um, not tribally affiliated um, just to kind of help give them this stepping stone around um, some of these um, concerns that the survivor has just to keep that forward movement going and that's kind of the going to be the running theme of what we're talking about today is you know don't count yourself out just because you might not be a tribally affiliated service or a resource or advocate you can still play a very pivotal role in allowing that survivor to kind of supplement their needs with you um, while they decide when and how is the best way for them to, you know, return back to um, their own community? Good question. Perfect. And then one more came in um, about, um, so actually two. So how can someone find more information about spiritual healing for deaf Native American survivors? And can ASL interpreters be provided on the reservation if the deaf Native survivor needs spiritual healing services? So that's a great question. Um, it wasn't until I came to work with CICASA that the uh, deaf and hearing impaired uh, survivors um, consideration even came to mind for me. Um, I really started to think like, wow, you know, what, what, what a important um, aspect of survivors um, and probably a, a lot of missed opportunities because we're not set up, we were not set up for that. We're still not set up for that in, in our tribal community here at Ute Mountain. Um, that would definitely have to be an extra step for an advocate to take on to find an interpreter to do that, um, to do that service. 
um, it's certainly something I'm working really hard to inform myself of in order to give you that information. Um, but as it stands right now, um, there are interpreters local to the area, but that would um, involve, you know, a cost. Um, uh, an agency would have to, you know, make the uh, make that service available uh, by paying for it uh, for a survivor. Um, I don't know if there's anything specific um, at this time for um, how to access that for, you know, in spirit through spirituality, um, that interpretation, but it's certainly an important need that we do need to overcome and we do need to find uh, ways to, uh, to provide that. Thank you for that question. Perfect. Thanks, Gina. And folks, as your questions come up, please feel free to type them in and then um, we'll, we'll have further opportunity to address those questions. So um, turning it back to you, Gina. Okay. So some considerations, and we talked about some of that um, in some of those, in some of your questions that you um, provided to me. So creating options for spiritual healing, um, be sensitive, um, to a survivor's cultural beliefs and their practices, uh, be aware and refer to those um, specific resources. At this particular point, um, you know, I would I would reach out to um, some resources that um, are known to you that are Native American, Indigenous specific. Um, I will have some of those also attached um, at the end of this uh, webinar for you to, to um, access uh, for the questions like that. Um, so the way in which you can create those options is, you know, if there is a, if there is smudging that's requested from a survivor, um, explain to the survivor or locate places at your agency that, um, the survivor can, um, smudge and, and access that, um, that cleansing, um, practice. Um, and again, uh, recognize, uh, the fear and the distrust that, um, uh, survivors, uh, may have with government and tribal systems um, that that fear and distrust is is of both um, non-tribal and tribal systems so therein lies uh, opportunity for a non-tribal or non uh, tribally affiliated uh, agency to kind of step in and supplement um, some supportive um, services for a survivor um, also a quick note that if you have a Native American um, advocate or, or staff member in your agency, don't assume that that's uh, a great fit uh, just because your survivor is is Native American and you have a Native American uh, staff that, you know, great, that's, that's the key. Um, that might very well be a great fit, but also we don't fully understand what the history might be of these two um, Native Americans, are they of the same tribe? That might be a reason why a survivor might not want to work with that person. Um, it might be a reason why they would want to work with that person. So again, try not to assume, um, allow the survivor to lead you in, in how they're feeling and what their preferences are. <coughs> Excuse me, be aware and work to overcome the stereotypes. Um, I wanted to uh, share an experience I had. Um, so I was I was providing advocacy for a survivor who uh, was assaulted and um, was also unfortunately um, uh, finding finding herself in uh, unrelated uh, cases and charges brought against her, and she was incarcerated in the local jail. Um, but I continued to come and visit her there. I asked the jail for a private uh, meeting space to keep her updated about where her, case, her assault case was. And um, she was very surprised to see me there. This was not the first time she'd been assaulted. Um, and she, you know, she had said that she wasn't, um, she wasn't sure that her case would continue on because she was, you know, getting into trouble and, and, and you know, catching other cases. Um, and she was really struggling with um, how to, you know, how to work through her trauma and then stay involved with her case. Um, that was a very successful case. We did 
we did see her through that um, and there was a felony conviction for her assault in that particular case. So just in advocacy, just a, just a note about how important your presence is and, and what a difference you could make is very important um, for a survivor. And again, don't discount um, that you may or may not be um, able to do that for, for someone just showing up is so very powerful. So I think we had some, some questions about this poll <laughs> um, and asking if you all know where or who to contact for guidance um, and advocacy services for a Native American Indigenous survivor. So we're going to do a quick poll. Great. Um, so we're getting folks um, to respond. So far, it's shifting quite a bit between yes and yes and no. Um, we have 57% who say yes, 45% who say no. Um, and again, it keeps shifting as folks um, vote. Um, if those of you who um, say yes, if you want to, in the meantime, type into the questions chat box um, where in your community or where in your area you would go to um, for guidance um, for um, advocacy services to, to Native American survivors. Um, so again, it's kind of shifting. It's it's staying a little bit between the like the 56 percent of you say yes, 44 percent say no. Um, <coughs> So I'm going to go ahead and close that poll um, and share. That final was 57% yes, 43% no. Um, and then we did have one person type in, um, they would contact the state coalition for guidance. Um, someone else mentioned they would contact the coalition to stop violence against Native women. Um, someone said Hesea Advocates, um, Brave Hearts Helpline. Um, so folks are, are um, putting in some, some great options. Um, Gina. For sure, for sure. And then um, again, um, keep in mind the two Colorado tribes, um, Ute Mountain and Southern Ute, who have current victim services um, within both um, both of those tribal communities. They have both tribal and federal um, advocacy services there. Um, so that's, those are some great contacts. Um, for the Denver metro area, there's also the Denver Indian Family Resource Center. They're also there and available. I would also challenge you all to think outside the box along with those, um, those other um, alternatives that were shared. Um, the Coalition to Stop Violence Against Native Women. They're a great resource. Um, but also recently it was brought to my attention um, as I'm learning about um, access to um, language and accessibility in general, um, that the uh, Asian Pacific um, Agency there in Denver do have um, interpreters of the Navajo language. Um, so that's, that's also a really um, important uh, resource, but one that you might not have just thought of um, generally. So again, think innovatively, think outside of the box, and don't count yourself out. Um, you may still have something, some important um, role to play. So thank you for that. Um, also, you can contact me at, <laughs> at CICASA. I'm happy to help you try to navigate um, how to do that. Um, and how we can find some um, some support for for um, getting that specific uh, resource to Native American Indigenous survivors. Um, I want to share with you um, this incredible uh, coalition called Nas Casa. They're the Navajo Apache Ute Hopi Zuni Coalition Against Sexual Assault and Family Violence. They're a multi-tribal, multidisciplinary group um, that and is organized to support services, coordinate care, promote justice uh, for um, and healing for survivors and their families. This is a non-funded um, coalition that exists um, here in the Four Corners Southwest region. And currently, uh, CICASA provides technical assistance to this group's work. Um, that coalition started in 2009 with a nurse practitioner and two midwives who, um, who saw the lack of care for sexual assault victims. 
Um, the group has since expanded in its membership and its tribes. The recent addition is uh, the Ute tribes and also expanded its recognition of what types of care are lacking to um, sexual assault victims, including their families and the communities. Um, here's a map of uh, North Casa, um, uh, the reservations, the tribal communities that it encompasses. Uh, currently, there are about 10 SANE units for adults and PEDS, um, about six shelters in three of the four four corner states that are located in tribal communities or are tribally managed. Um, and there are many tribal victim programs throughout all of the four corners and throughout all of these tribal nations. So again, if we're looking for some uh, places, um, some resources for you to access for your questions and how to provide um, that type of care and, and, and some guidance. Um, there is a great network of folks um, who are happy to help you with that in tribal communities. I will also include, um, I'll also include that resource listing for you as well. So those CASA meetings are held monthly and they're held at each of these different reservations um, in order to hold equality among the nations and their partners and also to remind um, all of us as service providers and agencies and collaborators of the vast distances that survivors would have to overcome to reach services like those that host those monthly meetings. Um, I wrote a, I have written a blog uh, for CICASA, so if you go to our website to our blog section, it's called Passing the Feather where I talk about um, uh, traveling to each of these locations for the monthly meetings of Nas Casa. So Nas Casa operates under a uh, CCR model, um, you know, holding equity among each nation with those monthly meetings, um, reading of the mission statement at the beginning of each of those meetings, acknowledging the difficult systems allows um, allows the tribal uh, agencies and advocates to kind of find some common ground and some understanding with one another um, and also uh, talk about the importance of law enforcement and tribal government partners um, continuing to do that education to tribal leaders and tribal legislators about changes that are so important and needed in tribal communities. Uh, collaboration is the only way that a lot of these barriers can be overcome communicating about new or changed services, same units, shelters, and tribal communities. They expand options and tools for advocacy agencies and responders, as well as survivors and their families. And most, if not all, tribal programs are grant funded and because tribes have difficulty sustaining through their own resources. And grants bring opportunities for services, but also wipe them away very easily. So, you know, working together in this network through this model, ensures that survivors and advocates can navigate those ebbs and flows. I, I apologize for the quality of this, um, uh, of this diagram, but this kind of just shows you um, the four directions, um, which signifies balance and harmony uh, for Native American Indigenous people. And when an assault happens, um, it's kind of a disruption of their world, uh, but Nazcasa, their, their work and their model is about this net of care and this res this restoration of balance um, for a survivor and their family. And if you notice in here, there really isn't a resource that doesn't play a role. So again, I you know I echo what I've been saying throughout is that you can play a role in this. There is there is really um, no service or resource that could not play a pivotal role in restoring this important balance um, to a survivor. Are there any questions so far, Maria? Um, no, it doesn't look like we have anything content wise. I just wanted to let folks know I did send a link to the Passing the Feather blog post that you talked about, Gina. Um, and then I sent the okay. link to the Asian Pacific Development Center in the chat box too. So you all have access to it. Perfect, thank you so much. So quickly as we wrap up, um, let's, talk, let's talk a little bit about healing and resiliency. Um, keeping in mind that, you know, uh, love and human connection um, is very important to recovery and resiliency. Just showing up 
um, to the jail to work with that survivor, um, that connection at a very um, hard time for that survivor made a lot of difference in how she chose to continue to cooperate with the with the prosecution of her assault case. Um, so that shows that that plays a very important part of um, of resiliency and recovery, um, social networking. Um, so, you know, work like Becky in her running um, for awareness. Um, she does public speaking and shares her story um, all over Indian country to inspire um, inspire survivors and to uh, inform uh, folks like us today of how important it is um, to support survivors and for advocacy and building uh, personal goals. And again, restoring that interconnectedness, that balance um, is so important for Native American Indigenous um, survivors um, and communities. So let's keep in mind also, like, as a, as a survivor or a victim, as they navigate this journey, um, some survivors find their healing in other practices that may not be tribal or spiritual. Um, and that uh, in order to, you know, gain their energy and their purpose and their meaning and, and healing, you know, that can come in many different forms. So again, you know, don't assume, um, allow for those options, um, be innovative, think outside the box. Um, and also we often follow the lead of survivors of sexual assault and determining where they are in this process. So always check in and make sure that you are following that guidance, applying their preferred position um, from victim to survivor. The incredible news is um, indigenous and Native American communities have always been survivors and have always lived in resilience. Um, this is just the work of how we cultivate that important medicine for those survivors. So through groups, it can be very impactful. Um, survivors um, finding a place to lead um, other survivors like Becky, um, finding their voice and their resiliency and strength to, um, to lead awareness and movement um, for sexual assault survivors. So taking up traditional arts and crafts, learning dances like in powwow, learning traditional foods and cooking, um, Indigenous and Native American communities are social ones. So activities and ceremonies include a wide circle of family and friends. Indigenous Native American people are ones that operate connected to one another, connected to their lands. That connection holds healing. And Becky understood that when she returned to her homelands and she finds her place back in the circle of this connected power. So, We've discussed um, Native American indigenous survivors of sexual assault, sexual violence. Um, we've talked about uh, Colorado Native American history. There's Becky's story. Um, please feel free to, um, to share that. Um, we also um, thank Becky and, and her family for her story and for um, the Indian Health Services program that put that video together and made that available for us to, to view and, and to discuss. Um, the jurisdictional experiences, the barriers, um, reporting, um, advocacy considerations, uh, collaboratives and coalition work like NAS CASA and re resilience. So I want to do one final poll to you all uh, to see if um, where you're at um, with given what we've discussed today, what other subjects might this webinar have inspired for your curiosity? I've given you some options, but please feel free to, um, to include um, any other thoughts you might have. So would you be interested in a webinar about jurisdictional uh, jurisdiction um, scenarios um, in an activity like what we ran through earlier, a quick activity, um, protection order considerations, that full faith and credit uh, discussion, um, how to effectively partner with a tribal agency or program um, or understanding the missing and murdered indigenous women movement kind of given um, what we talked about in this webinar. 
Great, Gina, and folks are um, definitely voting. Um, so we have um, about 19% of folks and that kind of keeps shifting um, with jurisdiction activities. We have 5% um, saying they want to learn more about protection order considerations, 55%, um, now 50% how to effectively, effectively partner with the tribal agency or program. 17% um, understanding the murdered, missing and murdered Indigenous women movement. Um, and again, that keeps shifting quite a bit as folks continue to, um, to vote. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and close this poll. Um, and again, feel free to, to um, type into the questions chat box if there are other topics that you are interested in. Um, so we ended up with 21% saying they were interested in jurisdiction activities, 13% say that they were interested in um, protection order considerations, 50% say how to effectively partner with a tribal agency or program, and 17% said that they um, wanted to learn more about the missing and murdered indigenous women movement. Um, great. Great, thank you for that. I really appreciate that. It helps me form kind of some next steps for us. So here are just some of the resources. Again, we'll be providing to you a more comprehensive um, access to that. Um, remember, I'm also a, a resource for you here at CICASA. I'm happy to help you um, if I can in any way. Um, here are some of the articles I talked about a little bit in, involving the Indian Health Services to help you understand um, uh, mistrust and, and um, the lack of confidence in those, uh, those kinds of services. Um, thank you for your time, your interest, and for all that you do um, and continue to do for survivors, for all survivors of sexual violence. Great, right. thank you, Gina. We did have a question that came in, and um, while we're addressing that, if you have any additional questions, folks, please feel free to type those in at this time. Um, the question that came in, Gina, was, um, is there a statewide database of Native therapists or counselors? Um, they mentioned that they only have one who's in practice in the entire county of El Paso. Well, that's a lot more than we have here in our region. <laughs> that would, that's a great idea. That's a great idea, but no, not that I know of. This is Agatha from Sicasa, and um, we are working currently uh, with uh, different resources and trying to mapping uh, basically a lot of different uh, services that are specifically related or provides uh, directed to Native American communities. Uh, we are really working on mapping that. As far as right now, um, I've been connected and talk to, talking to the Seven Stars uh, community here and the, the Native American community service providers in the Denver metro area. And also they connected me to um, and a health-related uh, program within the Denver Health Department that they're also collecting information and creating a database. So it is on the works. We are working really hard on those things. And um, also Gina started this project. So we are really <laughs> to, to um, work with them. And as soon as we get something like that, we will make it open and available for all of our members. So. We continue on that question. Definitely, I continue to be inspired by this, um, you know, this ever expanding conversation about these important um, needs specific to Native American Indigenous survivors, and I'm very um, motivated um, to continue this work to um, make sure that we are always doing our best to um, expand those options and provide um, those culturally specific uh, resources that are so needed. Great, thank you so much, Gina. It doesn't look like any other questions are coming in. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to, or anything that you'd like to leave folks with today? 
yeah, I just want to keep repeating that, you know, um, like the diagram you saw, like in Becky's story, um, just because you're not a tribally affiliated um, agency or resource or advocate, um, you still can play a very important role in um, the in this in the much needed uh, supportive um, resources in in helping a Native American Indigenous survivor. Um, and and there are a lot of uh, very important um, points of contact and resources in within tribal communities. Um, that can be helpful in, in guiding you in, in understanding those things and, and how to do better. Um, so definitely do not count yourself out. Um, there are just everyday more expanding um, capabilities um, and innovative um, ways in which uh, folks are, are determining that they can play a role in this. Um, so stay involved and, and don't think that you don't, you, you don't, um, you're not relevant to this because you probably are more than you even more than you could even think about. So, I, I continue to um, I continue to advocate for that. Great, thank you so much, Gina. Um, the the comments are pouring in. Of thanks for all this wonderful information for this informative webinar. Um, another thing just came in actually that Redwind has both a domestic violence tribal advocacy and sexual assault tribal advocacy training coming up in Colorado Springs next month. Um, Monica, if you could send that information to me. Um, I can send that out to, to folks who participated if they're interested. I could definitely send out that information. Um, so once again, thank you, Gina. Thank you everybody for joining us today on this very important topic and this very informative session that Gina has provided for us. Um, any questions that you have that come up for you um, after we log off our webinar, please do not hesitate to reach out to Gina um, and at her email, gina at cicasa.org. Um, I will include that information, her contact information in the email that will be coming within the next 30 minutes or so with the um, PDF of the slides that you saw today. Um, all of those are gonna be hyperlinked. So all of the articles that Gina mentioned, the video, those will all be available through that. Um, I will also be um, including a link to our survey, to our survey monkey that is very, very important to us. It helps us know that we're doing right by you and any any sort of information that, um, that you need in terms of training or webinars um, that you have the opportunity to share with us so that we can make that happen. Um, so please do fill out that survey. Um, we are working on our upcoming webinars. Um, we have some stuff lined up. We're still finalizing the details, but we're hoping to share with you how to use media to work with survivors, working with military sexual assault survivors. Um, and we're also looking at um, getting a non-consensual porn um, or also known as revenge porn webinar um, that's gonna be coming in May. Um, so keep an eye out for, um, for more informative webinars in the future. Again, thank you all so much for joining us. Please do not hesitate to reach out to us with anything that you might need. And we're so excited to have been able to spend this afternoon with you. Thanks. Thanks again, Gina. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, everybody. Take care.